A very warm welcome to you all on this beautiful spring morning. Um, a warm welcome to you all here, whether you're worshipping with us today on Zoom or whether you'll be joining us um, on the recording later in the week. It's great to all be together to worship. After the service, as always, there are refreshments through in the um, coffee bar in the hall, so please feel free to stay for that. And today is a local arrangement service. And we're very grateful to Colin Furbank, and we welcome him as he leads our service today. And also we welcome Kevin Curtis from the Canaan Trust Charity. And they are one of our charities we've been supporting this year and he'll be telling us a bit more about their work. So thank you for joining us, Kevin. And just one notice um, about next Saturday afternoon, if anybody would like to join um, a very small team at the moment to go out into the community to do a litter pick. Um, it's a great experience. It's an opportunity to share what we're doing and speak to people um, in the community. And if anyone would like to join us for that, it's at two o'clock. Um, if you could let Mick or myself know, um, that would be great. So we'll just take a moment now as we prepare for worship. So our call to worship, <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, as you have come to us, we are witnesses to your love. We offer you our whole selves today. Open our minds to understand your word. And we sing as part of our continuation of Easter, 297 from Singing the Faith, Christ is alive, let Christians sing, the cross stands empty to the sky.
so we come to our opening prayers. There is a response <coughs> to the words, you have given us good news, teach us to share it. You've given us good news, teach us to share it. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the message of Easter, for the assurance it brings of your triumph over death, the proof it offers that love will always have the last word. Yet alongside that message, there's another that perhaps we do not hear so often, a challenge which sometimes we can ignore, a call to action as well as celebration. You have given us good news. Teach us to share it. Dear Lord Christ appeared to his followers, demonstrating he had risen, and then he sent them out to proclaim to all his resurrection. He met with them, then called them to lead others to him. He gave them joy and then told them to share it. Easter was not for the few, but for all. Not just for them, but the whole world. You have given us good news. Teach us to share it. Dear Lord, forgive us that we so often forget that. Having experienced Christ's risen presence, we keep it to ourselves. Having met with him, we fail to introduce others to him in turn. Having received so much, we have shared so little. You have given us good news. Teach us to share it. Dear Lord, we thank you for those who have fulfilled Christ's call, those who first made the gospel known to us, those who proclaim it to others. We pray for all who are specially gifted to proclaim the good news. May many meet with Christ and come to know him as their Lord and Saviour. You have given us good news. Teach us to share it. Dear Lord, you call each one of us to be your witnesses, to tell others what we have experienced of Christ's love, to make known what he has done for us, to testify the way he has changed our lives. Help us to do that faithfully, to play our part in your kingdom and purpose. Through us, may others come to meet Christ and know him for themselves. You have given us good news. Teach us to share it. Amen. And we share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we reflect on those words, forgive our sins, forgive us our sins, as we sing 423. Forgive our sins as we forgive, you taught us, Lord, to pray.
hear now our first reading, which Maureen will read to us. And this is part, of course, of the resurrection experiences of the disciples. And at this point, the two people who'd met Christ on the road to Emmaus um, have just returned to Jerusalem with great excitement and explained to the disciples what they've experienced. But of course, it's still this uncertainty as to what is really happening. So we now hear the next stage of Christ's appearance to his disciples, but also, and more importantly perhaps, is what he challenged them to do. As you listen to this reading, I want you to think about what is it in the reading that really strikes home to me? Because that is then the discussion time in our local arrangement service. So Maureen will now read to us from Luke's Gospel. Readings from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled and is written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached at his, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Amen. To help you in your thoughts, I've actually picked out what I feel the passage divides into, into four particular sections. And firstly, we have Christ appearing and proving to them just exactly who he is and what he's like now. There's then this bit of sharing food, which probably emphasizes the fact that he felt still in the need in that physical sense. But then, of course, is what he goes on to tell them particularly, the explanation of the scriptures. It's a fulfillment. My life is a fulfillment of all that's gone before. And finally, there is the challenge to the disciples. So just for a moment, I'd like you either you can just think through yourself or if you want to share it with somebody else, what about those four things either still strikes you most? One of the things I always find about Bible readings is that as familiar as they are, every now and then there's something or a particular Bible reading which strikes home and probably sometimes for the first time. And it may happen to you at times as well. So just for a time, just a couple of minutes, and then I'll ask if people want to share in particular where they feel this reading has said something to them today.
Um, right, is anyone who would desperately like to say something, I wouldn't say desperately, would like to say something that, that might just enlighten us all as to what experiences that has meant to people? Well, not Mary said, just, just say. I was interested by the fact that Jesus asked to share food with them. So if this is an appar just an apparition, he wouldn't actually have been able to physically eat. But they gave him some fish and he ate it. So, um, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Um, and we still share food together. Anyone else? Oh, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Go on. Well, this is Kevin Curtis. Good morning to you all. Maybe I can use this as a perfect opportunity to introduce my two little sculptures and at the end of the service I invite you to come and look at them. Basically what today's reading has always said to me is it challenges me, it challenges us to make it real. We listen to that reading and I don't know about you but I'm thinking well how did the disciples not? You know where's their faith? They didn't recognize Jesus, etc. They didn't feel him, his presence in their midst. And what that reading says to me is that, yeah, we're here in church this morning. We've come to be in the Lord's presence. But where is he? He's next to you. He's on the end of the road. Colin was sharing that there was a couple of individuals sleeping rough outside here during the week. He's there. These sculptures, I saw this one in Rome. It's life-size. This one is in uh, Chicago life-size by a Canadian sculptor. And I contacted him because that's the kind of character I am. Once I've got a mission, you stop me. And I made contact with him and I said, the, your sculpture was very powerful, spoke to me. Is there any way I can get a picture or whatever? He said, Kevin, I'm just in the process of doing some miniatures. I'll send you some. And these are them. So you got here, Jesus the beggar. And here we have Jesus, the homeless individual. Jesus is with us every single day. We just have to see him. That's the challenge I give to all the staff at the Canaan Trust. That next phone call, that next ring at the door. It may be Mrs. So-and-so, it may be Charlie, it may be Fred, it may be whoever. But really it's Jesus. And he's looking for you to recognize his presence. Anyone else want to say something? Right. We're following this on now with the reading from Acts. And so we'll see what Peter, by then, is taking up, particularly from that reading. So the reading is from Acts chapter 3, um, verse 12. So what has already happened, of course, by now, is that they've experienced Pentecost, and Peter has talked to the people about what that experience means, explaining that they weren't drunk, etc., but this was their real experience of the Holy Spirit. And then, just immediately previous to this, he has helped in the healing of a lame man. So a man who'd been lame since birth has now got up and walked. And the people, of course, have seen it happen. So whatever his words have meant about Jesus and the resurrection, they've seen it in action. And so this is an ideal opportunity for Peter to explain just what is happening <coughs> both to him, the disciples, but also is now being offered to the people. And so we read from Acts chapter 3, 
and verse 12. When Peter saw this, that is, the lame man and it being witnessed, he said to the people, People of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that he complete, has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I'll be coming back to that after we sing our next hymn, which is one that does encourage us to read our Bible carefully and to let God speak to us through it. So it's 161, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word.
So, Peter made it very clear at the end of that reading, talking to the Jewish people, repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. And this despite that list he'd given before of how they had led to the crucifixion of Jesus. Those words, of course, would mean a lot to Peter himself. When we look at Peter through his time with Christ and, of course, after, etc., then there were very many times when he, despite being part of what seemed to be that inner circle of disciples, he was one that went, for example, to the Mount for Transfiguration. He often seems to be picked out by Jesus as a leader. There's this idea of him changing his name to mean rock. And so there was all that encouragement, as it were, being made of him. But of course, even in this little bit, <clears throat> he doesn't mention the times when he was rather shameful in what he did. You may remember the time in, um, when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was one of those who fell asleep. And then of course, in those final times together, when he said, I will not deny you, I will go to prison as it were if I'm challenged, and Christ said to him quite clearly, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. But in that conversation, Christ still said the words to him, when once you have turned back, in other words, once when you have repented and asked for forgiveness, then you will strengthen your brothers. And here is Peter then able to do that. And of course, they're already facing opposition from the Jewish leaders. If you read on after the a few verses that, that we may have heard there, you will find that least of the people listening to him, a lot of them actually then accepted the word. We're told that 5,000 had by then joined their number. So quite an impact on those very early stages of the experience after Pentecost. But of course the Jewish leaders were still plotting. And again as you read on you'll see what they tried to do to silence them, they threatened them. But they didn't dare do too much because the people had witnessed this amazing healing. And so they're in this predicament as well. And of course the disciples still feel empowered. This is what they've been chosen to do to carry on with their actual preaching. It raises the question then as to what hope that gives to everyone the promises that are being made. How much did that in that reading speak to us very clearly towards the end? First of all, did we recognize Christ's presence? Do we recognize Christ's presence in our lives? And do we then go to say, yes, forgive our sins, we want to move on? And also, do we want to witness? Some of you may have realized from the notices, and it's in again this week, that Friday group, the group that I attend on Friday evening once a fortnight, have chosen this term to look at the Alpha course. Not the full Alpha course, I must admit, but at least to dip into it. The reason for this was that one of our members suggested that it had been attended about 20 years ago, as it were, and the experience then was one thing. Would it be any different now? Because to some extent, every time we open our Bibles, as I said, there's a possibility it will speak to us in a different way. And so that's what we decided to do. It's made very easy. Paula fortunately made all the links for us. But you can follow the course through series, session by session. And we were selective in what we did. And we're still doing it, as you can see. And you're given a 30 minute presentation which includes all kinds of things, but a lot of it is Nicky Gumbel explaining the particular Bible passages relevant to the topic for the day. And he sets it up very clearly. But what to me has made a bigger impact is the people who've then appeared in the videos, the ones who've attended the Alpha course, and their lives have changed. And particularly, two people were given as examples who attended an Alpha course while in prison. You'd wonder at times, did they choose that hour or two as an easy option? 
let's go somewhere where it's warm and comfortable, we'll have food, etc., that might be different to what we normally get. But even so, both of them gave the testimony that this had transformed their lives. One, I think, if I remember rightly, actually became a vicar um, in, in later years. Uh, and so, all the time, as I said, we're being offered this opportunity to change our lives. One of the questions that was at the very beginning of our start of the Alpha course was, and what's your experience of the church? Everyone had to confess we were brought up as children. For many Alpha courses, that will not be the case. One or two did say, I did have doubts, I had experiences through my life where perhaps I wasn't quite as committed, but of course, by now, basically, people who attend our group are quite committed in various ways, both in their personal life, but of course, in the way they share their uh, gifts with the community in which they live. But what I think we're trying to get at particularly, and of course we've got Cain and Trust here with Kevin Curtis today, that it's never too late to change. That sometimes it's an opportunity which might be given to us by the experience we have with other people, and sometimes it's that close experience that we might have ourselves with Jesus, with God, that we say, yes, this is what I want to do with my life. I remember, I think it was on East Midlands Today recently, <coughs> someone was being interviewed who was addicted, I think it was to drugs, but I forget, had a real addiction. And it was a charity which helped him to realise that he could become free of it. He thought that that is my lifestyle. This is what I've got into. This is how I live my life. But it was by just having that help, I'm not saying it was a Christian help at all, but it was someone who was able to provide that kind of support, so again their life could be changed and transformed. And so I hope today, as you read through that, as you think through what it is that happened with those disciples and how they were empowered to be real witnesses. I've chosen as our next hymn, the hymn written by John Newton because it probably sums up as much as anything the idea that there is a promise to all of us. And so we'll sing 440, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Just briefly from Junior Church, they have been thinking about Peter as well. So, pardon me, I'll hold it back there. Um, we've been looking over the last few weeks at Bible heroes from the Old Testament. And today we've started looking at Bible heroes from the New Testament. So we're looking particularly at the apostles. So this week we've looked at Peter, who we found out Jesus appointed to start the church after Jesus had ascended to heaven. So we looked at all the things that Peter did, and we've talked about some of the things that... Well, he's my favourite apostle, I've got to say. Not just because of my name, but because he, he made mistakes and he asked the questions we'd probably ask. And so he was a really good sort of model for how we can follow Jesus. So we've looked at some of those things. And then in the future, we're going to look at more of the apostles. We're going to look at Paul and some of his work. And we're going to look at some of the journeys of the other apostles as well. But today, we focused on what Peter's done. How he started out as a fisherman. How he followed Jesus, leaving everything behind. Potentially prestige and quite a, a sort of lucrative profession. And just left it all and followed this person who called him. And then, later on, became the founding father of the Christian church. Yeah, so Kevin is the first of our church charity visitors. Um, we arranged for Aaron and I to come on a Tuesday, May the 14th, I think. And then November and June the 30th, someone from the student Christian movement. So, so Kevin is our first. Yeah. Good morning to you. And, and thank you for inviting me. I've visited the church on many occasions, visiting uh, lots of different groups associated with the church in the hall, etc. But this is my first time to actually be able to come and join in your Sunday service and uh, to join in your uh, prayer and praise. So thank you for uh, offering me that uh, honour and that privilege. I've been the uh, project manager at the Canaan Trust uh, for 15 years. And throughout the journey, um, it has been, uh, again, as I say, uh, an honour and a privilege because, yes, there are many homeless uh, organisations, projects, uh, charities across the area, across the country, etc., but there are very few Christian homeless charities. The Canaan Trust started in 1995 not by... Uh, the fact that someone came together and says, oh, we better get a Christian charity organised, there's a need, let's do X, Y and Z. But the Canaan Trust came to, to being because of the power of the Spirit and the will of the Lord. In Long Eaton at that time, 1995, there was an individual in his mid-twenties, a guy called Kenny who was a very affable individual but was homeless and he was known quite well across the area and he was known to lots of the local churches and to lots of the local pastors and ministers and then one time he came across the inhumanity of man to man in that a group decided it might be fun or whatever motivation was in their mind, clearly I don't know. But they sprayed him with lighter fuel and they set him on fire. And he was badly burnt. And he was rushed to the special burns unit at the city hospital in Nottingham. And at that stage, a local pastor in Long Eaton who knew of him basically was sitting down one tea time with his own family and he'd got two teenage sons and they were talking about Kenny because they knew him and they reflected on his current plight he was homeless and now he was badly burnt what was going to become of him if and when he was discharged from hospital 
And then one of the teenage sons said, Well, we're Christians. We need to do something. I've got a bedroom. My brother's got a bedroom. What if I bunk in with my brother and we go and meet Kenny and we invite him to come and live with us? And after family discussion and prayer, that's what they did. And Kenny went to live with this family when he was discharged from hospital. And then a group of individuals in that pastor's own church heard what the family had done and recognised that, yes, it is important as Christians that we come to church on Sunday, that we honour the Lord and we praise the Lord, but our faith is more than that. Our faith is more than that. Our faith is recognising the Lord and putting into action what Easter is all about. Easter is about eternal life, but Easter is about sharing the Lord's love. For me, personally, the cross is the ultimate sign of my faith, and it's the ultimate sign of the challenge the Lord puts to us. I notice you've got a cross just in front of here. Let me just pick it up, it's easier to show you. We talk about the cinema of Adam, our sin, our propensity to sin. But what does that mean? And Christ came and he died on the cross to rescue us from sin, to show us the ultimate sign of God's love. What does that mean? It's here. It's here. When we think of the cross, we focus, I think, too much on suffering. And we think the Lord calls us to accept suffering and to put up with it in our lives. The way to faith, the way to eternal life is through suffering. That's not what the cross says to me. What the cross says to me is it's all about sin, and it's all about God's love. If you think of the word sin, it's three letters. And what's the middle one? I. I. Whenever sin's involved, I's usually in the middle of it. There's a selfishness. There's a focus purely on I. And that's what plagues our world at the moment. Everyone's out for themselves. And that's why they need us. That's the message we've got to bring, the Easter message. Because this cross says to me, the love of God, the ultimate love of God in giving us his son, who was willing to die on the cross for us, is that ultimate, I crossed out. That the challenge I crossed out that is what God's love is all about and that's what the Cana Trust is about we're trying to bring a message of God's love to those who are downtrodden who those whose lives have fallen apart not culpably they've not chosen that Something's happened, and if you just had a chance of actually being where we are in the Canaan Trust for a couple of minutes and meeting some of the individuals and hearing their backstories, I go out at two or three in the morning because we get phone calls, people reporting to us, Do you know there's someone in West Park? There's someone here, and I've had calls here. There's someone in the doorway of the church. And we've come out and we've sat down and we've listened and we've heard their story. And invariably, it's a story that involves hurt and pain, not choice. Sadly, this week, we had the news of a very close individual that I've known for 10 years 
His name was Jamie, and I commend him to your prayers. Jamie is in his late, was in his late 30s. He was brought up in an alcoholic family, and he became an alcoholic. But he was the most lovely guy you could ever meet. He was a brilliant upholsterer. There isn't a factory in the area that wouldn't employ him because of his skills. But the alcohol got to him. And his life was destroyed by it. And he tried and he tried and he tried to give it and challenge it. And we were part of that journey with him for many, many, many years. Thankfully, we usually are successful. With Jamie, Jamie stopped drinking a year ago and hadn't had a drink since. But the damage to his liver was terminal and nothing medically could be done to intervene. And sadly, last Wednesday, he had a seizure and he died. God bless him. May he rest in peace now. But the work of the Canaan Trust is the work of our Lord in the community. St. Paul taught us all about um, the body of Christ. There are many parts to the body of Christ. You are its heart and soul. The Canaan Trust are its hands. We practically put into effect what the Lord commanded us all to do, go out and to show his love to those who need it. And you are an integral part of our work. Please never, never, never think that, well, yeah, Kevin and the team and the Canaan Trust, the organization, they're doing what they're doing, wonderful work or whatever. But we cannot do that work without you. You are an integral part of that. And what you do here this morning is an integral part of that work. Because we believe in the power of prayer. We often meet challenges and obstacles. And we think, how the hell are we going to do this? What is the answer to this challenge, etc.? And we turn to the Lord in prayer. And we say in faith that we're doing our best to do his work. And if he truly believes we are doing his work, he will help us and he will enable us. And he'll do it through your good selves. Many of you will know that at this moment in time, for the last couple of years, we've been uh, working very hard on a female house. We bought a new, another property two years ago. We'd saved up some money. We'd raised some money. We'd got enough for a deposit, 110000 And we bought the house on a mortgage. The house cost us 350000 It's the right house in the right place, but it's in hell of a state. And for the last two years, we've had architects and consultants and engineers in and making all sorts of plans and the plans have been passed by the local authority and we're ready to provide nine safe secure places for homeless females because the females get forgotten they are part of the hidden homeless you'll see lots of male homeless in terms of street homeless but you won't see that many female homeless because it's not safe. They would invariably be physically or emotionally abused. So they become hidden. They're not even recorded in official statistics because the statistics work on the streets where you won't find them. So we then get to, that, to know that to create this house it's going to cost us in excess of 600,000. And my little board of volunteer trustees look at me and say, Kevin, how the hell are we going to get that? We will. We have. We are. 
with the Lord's help. And it's not that the Lord sends us someone who gives us hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds or however many noughts you might want to put on the end. I compare our funding to the cat's eyes on the road. Every single pound that's donated to us is another cat's eye on the road. And if you look down the road, yes, one cat's eye leads to another cat's eye, to another cat's eye, to another. But the person can safely get home through the darkness because of the cat's eyes. Well, we could get safely home because of the individual pounds that individuals and organisations donate to us. That's what makes it possible for us to do. Twelve years ago, when I first kind of came to talk on behalf of the Canaan Trust in another venue, uh, I spoke about the power of the pound, and that if everyone I met just gave us a pound, we would achieve everything that we need to achieve. And to this day, there's a little lady, a senior citizen, and periodically she appears at our front door in Long Eaton, rings the doorbell, and whichever member of staff answers the door, uh, she's standing there and she just has a pound in her hand and she says, Kevin asked for one of these. And she hands the pound in periodically. That's what does it. So never feel that your contribution or you can't do anything, etc., either individually or collectively as a church. You can. You are the cornerstone of what we do. We're the front men, but you are the power behind us. And so we are truly, truly grateful for all that you do. But the most important thing you do is pray. If you can do nothing else, spare a thought for us each day. Pray for the people that we're trying to help. Pray for the people that we haven't yet met. And pray for the team. Because the team work very hard. And yes, it's challenging at times. And sometimes it can be soul destroying. But the power of prayer carries us through. So, please, find a place in your heart for us for the Canaan Trust. We are trying to do the Lord's work. That is our only motive. And we are trying to bring his love to those who need it most. God bless you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your prayers. God bless. Yeah, so I presume, Kevin, you'll be staying for a while if people want to talk specifically, yeah? Good? Uh, if you, well, uh, we'll, we'll move on, yeah. <clears throat> so we turn now to our prayers for others. There is a response to the words, Lord, in your mercy. The response is, hear our prayer. So let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we look around our world and see so many problems, we bring our prayers to you for others. We look upon the pain of the people of Gaza, Ukraine and Yemen and so many other places where there is a real yearning for peace. We commend to you the leaders of factions and nations and pray that they may be reflect upon the past and be guided for the future and to try to seek conclusions to these dreadful situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as we look upon rising prices, we see so many people affected by the cost of living crisis. So much poverty, not just in this country, but all around the world. We commend to you those with responsibility for national and global economic policy and pray that they may learn from the mistakes of the past and be guided in decisions for the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as we look upon the inequalities of our world, we see your children suffering discrimination because of gender, race, background and disability. We commend to you policymakers in government and business and pray 
that they may learn ways to foster equality of opportunity for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as we look upon your church, we recognize that not all people find a genuinely warm welcome. Sometimes we are happy as we are, and difference can be challenging. We commend to you all Christian people and pray that we may learn to value those who are like us and those who are different. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we look upon the people of our community, we see many in need. We bring to you those who are suffering as a result of health, health of loved ones, people who feel isolated, those who are grieving for someone they love who's died. And today we pray especially for the work being done by the Canaan Trust to help people, particularly in the Long Eaton area, in great need at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious God, we pray for ourselves that we may reflect on our lives, learn from our mistakes, seek your wisdom, and grow as disciples of the risen Christ. For we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. And we receive the offertory. One of the interesting to me about our services is that a friend in Kenya always likes to watch us with another friend on a Monday. And I know they've been inspired by quite a lot of what they've picked up from the way we worship here, the things we share, uh, and I shall wait to hear what his responses are this week um, when he's followed today's service, to see the kind of things that we as a church are challenged to do, both in our personal lives, but also, of course, as a church community. And we sing the final hymn, 364, All for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. 364.
Lord, thank you that you don't give up on us when we fail, that you offer us a fresh start through your forgiveness. Guide and teach us that we may learn from our mistakes and walk with us into each new day. In Jesus' name, amen.